I'd like to introduce our uh, featured speaker, Chris Patterson of uh, Merriman Financial Education Foundation. He is director of research. And um, so he'll go through several slides. Uh, we, Chris, I don't know if you will, you want to just uh, save some time at the end for questions. So your, yeah, your flow is okay. Okay. And uh, I will give you a heads up that my four questions I didn't get to ask of the audience, I'll ask you. So I'm, I'm sure you got, got all that in mind. But um, at any rate, uh, thank you for spending your time with us and especially getting up early in a, in a West, you know, on the West Coast to spend some time with our this group. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing your, your, your words, uh, your words and uh, your ideas. Well, thanks for the introduction. And you described me earlier today as an expert, and my dad's words are ringing in my ears that an expert is a has-been drip under pressure. Uh, so I I feel humbled and grateful for the opportunity to present today. And it's a Saturday morning. We should have some fun. So I hope that we have some fun as we go through this presentation. And I also hope I can be pithy and get you through the slides fairly quickly so we have plenty of time for question and answer because I, I usually learn a lot from the questions and answers. As I was uh, talking earlier though, I, I am really excited about this presentation because it's the first time I've spoken deeply about diversification. It's the first time I really thought about it in the context of portfolio construction and I think it's going to bring up some interesting ideas in a different way that certainly I learned things creating the presentation and hopefully people will learn things going through it with me. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about, first of all, why diversification matters and then the importance of perspective and uh, and then the ingredients that go into a diversified portfolio and what happens when we mix them and why mixing is so important. We'll talk about simplicity versus complexity, uh, then um, the implications for accumulators and retirees. It's easy to have all this stuff be back tested with lump sums, but I think it's important to bring in some cash flows to see what happens during you know, real life scenarios. And then we'll summarize and have some question and answer. So let's start out with why does diversification matter? And I think the simplest way to think of this is to go back, say, a decade or so to 2013 and look at the S&P 500. And imagine you're at that point in time and you're trying to figure out what the winners are going to be or whether you should invest in the whole S&P 500 or just pick some stocks within the S&P 500. Well, what I've done is I've charted the return of the S&P 500 and the top 10 stocks. Now, if you had picked the top two, Apple did great. Exxon didn't do so well. It actually, you know, underperformed the the index. If you had picked all of them, you would get the return of the index with this fairly smooth ride, relatively speaking. But if you picked an individual stock, the academics tell us your expected return was the same return for other stocks of its type because there's no way to know which are going to be the winners and which are going to be the losers so these are all large cap blend stocks but you would have taken on all of the volatility of that individual stock for no added expected return and you can see that in this chart that you would have probably you know randomly picked one of these and maybe you would have outperformed the index maybe you would have underperformed the index and and you would have had this very, very bumpy ride. So the reason diversification matters in essence is that you can you can take things that have the same expected return, combine them, continue to get that return, but get rid of a lot of the volatility. As long as those things are not going to wiggle up and down in perfect synchronicity, as long as they're not technically perfectly correlated. So that's the power of investing with a diversified portfolio. And we'll go deeper, but that's the gist of it at the 100,000 foot view. Now, before we get into more of the detail, I want to um, take a look at a really, really important concept in investing, and that's perspective. And I'm going to step us out of category for a minute and have us look at some images just to 
kind of, like I said, we should have fun. It's on a Saturday morning. So I've got a picture up here and I strongly suspect none of you can tell what it is. I certainly can't. But as we zoom out, as we get farther away from this image, you can start to maybe form an opinion about what it is. Well, maybe it's maybe it's a fish or a map or an island or I don't know, is it sand? Ah, it's that goofy undersea creature, the chambered nautilus, right? So, so basically you can be too close to something and not understand what it really is. And that's true in investing for sure. You can, you can look at a day of returns and not really understand what's going on. Here's another example. Now, some of you are probably just nerdy enough, you know exactly what it is. Plus it was recently in the news. But here's another perspective on the same thing. So this is zooming out both of the wider angle view and zooming out in time. And now you can tell that this is actually a solar eclipse. And in, it's not just a solar eclipse, it's a solar eclipse at sea. And because we've zoomed out, you can see things you don't normally see. You can see the shadow of the moon coming across the sky from the right hand side. You can see it blocking the sun. You can see the shadow of then mo moving to the left. And you can also tell that this ship is moving. I Now I actually experienced this. It was an amazing, amazing thing. While we were on the ship experiencing it, I had no idea that the ship was moving because it was moving relatively slowly. But when you expand your time horizon and you compress it in this time lapse, you can see all of that happening. So perspective is really, really important, and especially in investing. So to illustrate that, let's shift back into category. Let's, let's look at three investments in one day. So uh, we're going to look at these in different time horizons, but we'll start out with one day. And I think all of us would agree one day is not long enough to learn much about different kinds of investments. But we've got investment A, which you'd probably say yeah, it looks like something fairly stable. It's a stable investment and it's declining. So, you know, maybe it has a negative expected return, but it's only a day. Investment B is probably more volatile and declining. And investment C, we would never want to invest in that based on one day's of, day of data because it's going down into the right at the most rapid pace with a lot of volatility. But one day is not enough, right? So let's let's go out to six months. Well, if we go out to six months, well, now it's starting to look like maybe B is the highest return investment and A still looks pretty stable and C is just volatility for no reason. It's, it's kind of a medium return thing. And then you go out to a year, it's like, oh, well, now I really can't figure out what the difference between B and A is, or, or I mean B and C. But A looks like it's that stable thing still. Certainly at five years, I should be able to tell, right? So B is the investment with the highest long-term return. And at 10 years, certainly I have enough data. Yep, absolutely. B has the highest long-term return. C, not very interesting. And, and A is the safe thing. But if you go out to 47 years with those same investments, you get a very different picture. And I think most of us would say that this 47 year picture looks fairly compelling. It looks interesting. There must be something going on when the difference in the cumulative return of C is so much higher than B and B is so much higher than A. And it probably won't surprise you if you follow our work at this point to learn that A is short term government bonds, B is the S&P 500 and C is US small cap value. And don't get too hung up on small and value if you're not familiar with the terms. We'll spend just a little more time on them in a minute. But it points out that it's really, really easy in investing to get the wrong end of the stick and learn the wrong lessons. For example, if I run a portfolio optimization on my portfolio going back five years or 10 years, it tells me I should put almost all of my assets into a highly concentrated stock position that's done extremely well for me. <laughs> but that asset is highly valued, it's overvalued now, and it's a disproportionate amount of my portfolio, and there's no guarantee the future will look like the past. So I, I take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, I, I value more these 50 year and 100 year perspectives. 
So now we have an idea of the importance of perspective. Let's shift and look at the importance of ingredients and what ingredients are available to us. And again, I'm going to start out of category with food. So if I was to ask you how many foods there are in the world, depending on how varied your diet is or how adventuresome you are, you'd probably say there were hundreds or thousands. I'd probably draw the line somewhere between thousands and tens of thousands because there's a lot of things people consider as food that I wouldn't eat, but, but it's a lot, right? There's, there's probably thousands of kinds of food. And that means that a, a chef trying to make a meal could be totally befuddled and not know what to do. But fortunately, the science of, of flavor and the science of the way our human body senses flavor gives the chef some principles to work on. It turns out we sense things in six basic categories, spicy, sour, sweet, salty, umami, and bitter. And the art of cooking is really in combining these different flavor groups in artful ways so that what we taste when we eat a really wonderful meal has these multiple dimensions in balance. And in a sense, it's a diversified flavor. I mean, sure, sometimes we grab a handful of salty chips and all we want is salt. But most of us wouldn't call that a great meal. A great meal usually fires on multiple cylinders here. It's got different things going on. So the, in the same way that we can distill those flavors down to their key elements, academics have looked at the world of investing, thousands of companies, thousands of bonds, and have distilled them down into their key ingredients. What are the things that drive their long-term return? And in the world of fixed income, it's pretty simple. It's either the term, the length of the bond, or the credit rating of the, the company that is effectively seeking a loan. So a long bond that is exposed to all of the uncertainties of future inflation and monetary policy risk would it be expected to have a higher return. And typically they do, not always, but typically. And similarly, a fly-by-night company seeking a loan through a bond is expected to pay a higher return than the U.S. government with a short-term bond that can print money to pay you back. So those are the two attributes that historically have driven the returns for fixed income. In the world of equities, there are many different models. I'll show you several of them, but the model I like the most, the one that I use the most is the Fama French five factor model. And it basically says that you should get some compensation and historically have gotten some compensation for taking market risk for investing in the stock market instead of a risk free bond. And you should also have an expected future return that is higher if you invest in the smaller part of the market because it's more volatile it's a little bit riskier um, and historically there has been a little higher return and interestingly these returns come in at different they don't come in in, in synchronous timing they come in with less than 100 percent correlation which gives us an opportunity for diversification um, there's also a premium for value for investing in companies that are uh, out of favor, companies that have uh, often gone through a tough time recently because we tend to be able to buy them at a discount. And so when you can buy them at a discount, you have a margin of safety, as Benjamin Graham would have said, and you expect a higher return for that. And historically, there has been a higher return for that. Profitable companies have also done better and companies that are more conservative in their investing have done better. So these different attributes describe what's been available in the past. And if we assume the future has some semblance to the past, and I'll give you a reason to believe that in a minute, then we would expect that maybe we would continue to get those returns. Now, I said that there are multiple models. There are three, four and five factor models from Fama and French. There are also models from AQR, Alpha Architects, Q Factors, and all of them quantify the value of these different attributes or pieces of the market. So since I focused on the five-factor model from Fama and French, I'll just walk through those briefly. 
Um, the, the market factor has been worth 5.5% above risk-free. So if we say risk-free has been roughly what inflation was since 1970, around 4%, then that would say that if you invested in a market fund, you would expect about a 9.5% nominal return, which is a, about what it's been. It's been closer to 10. Um, the size factor is 2.1%. The value factor has been worth 2.9%. Profitability, 3.1%. And investment, 3.0%. So the immediate reaction, I think, from, from some looking at this would be, well, why don't I just go buy a multi-factor fund that gives me 100% exposure to all of those attributes? And the answer is, it's not available. And the reason it's not available is that as you reach for one of these factors, you often give up one of these other factors. So it's not easy to get 100% exposure to all of these factors. In fact, the three factors that are the easiest to find are market size and value in small cap value funds. And even in a small cap value fund, you might only get you might be able to get 100% exposure to the market factor, but only 20% exposure to size and 20% exposure to value. So uh, it's not possible to get them all at once, but it's worthwhile. I'm going to try and make the case for you that it's worthwhile to get exposure to more of these in your portfolio than just one. And to give you an idea of how these attributes were found and developed, uh, this is some data from Kenneth French's website. You can go and you can actually download and analyze this data on your own. And basically what they do is they go back and they look at the history of returns going all the way back to 1926, dividing the market into five different buckets of size and five different buckets of value. Um, so the five different buckets of size, you can think of it as the smallest 20%, the next smallest 20%, the middle 20%, the largest 20% and the next largest 20% quintiles is what they call them. So, so they divide it that way. And then they do the same quintile divisions going from value to blend, which would be the medium to growth. And it's this picture essentially that won the Nobel prize. It was this analysis where they went back and they looked and they found out that the things on the left hand side of the chart, the value things tended to have had a higher return. The things at the bottom of the chart had a higher return. And that was the identification of these first two factors or attributes of companies that smaller companies had historically grown faster and been more volatile and value companies had historically grown faster and been more volatile. Now, the most interesting thing to me on this chart is how much bigger the differences are in that bottom row. And why would that be? Why would the bottom row be more different than the top row? We have the small value box here delivering 15.8% and the small growth box only delivering 2.37%. And the, the explanation that to me at least is most intuitive is that there are a huge number of companies in the small category. There's a very small number of companies in the large category. And in the, in the large category, those large companies have hundreds of analysts that, that look at them and try and anticipate their earnings and analyze the strength of their moats and their, their, the strength of their financials. So it's very, very efficient. The market is very efficient at the top. At the bottom, it's much less efficient. There are many com companies that aren't monitored, aren't uh, really analyzed. There's room for you to be the one analyst who goes in and discovers an opportunity. Um, there's a lot more room for a wider range of returns. There's a lot more room for emotion to come into, into play. And I think that's why there's this greater distribution at the bottom. And it's something we shouldn't ignore. Now, many people have said, once you publish a premium, it's going to go away. Well, if we look at this same data from 2000 to 2023, it didn't go away. In fact, the difference, maybe there's a little bit less of a premium for small in value because now the return was only 12.5%. And the but the growth was now negative. The small growth was negative 0.21%. So 
So the premium has lasted. It has lasted long after the publication of this work. And I think that, again, speaks to the fact that there's probably something fundamental and intrinsic about the financial of companies in these categories and the emotions of investors around companies in these categories and their behavior, investor behavior, that suggests these premiums will continue. Now, if you own the total market or the S&P 500, it's tempting to think you already have these. If you own the S&P 500, you've got some value companies. If you own the total market, you've got small companies, you've got value companies. Why am I not already diversified into these different attributes of the market? And the answer is that the small that you own in a total market fund is offset by the large. The value that you own in a total market fund is offset by the growth. You don't get any benefit. The only risk factor you're exposed to in a total market fund is the market risk factor. And that means you're, you're, you're missing out. And we'll, we'll discuss why in our mixing section. So where do we find these ingredients? We find them in mutual funds and ETFs. And you can find a wide range of very cost effective large cap blend funds, obviously, but you can also find a lot of large cap value, small cap blend and small cap value funds that occupy these spaces. So a, a small cap value fund would be a fund that just includes companies that are in that bottom left hand corner of the chart we looked at. They're smaller by market capitalization. So the total value of the company is smaller and they're out of favor. So they're trading at a lower price to book or price to earnings. So whatever the stock price times all of the outstanding shares is, is a lower multiple compared to the intrinsic value of the company than say a growth company. And the fact that these are widely available in cost-effective tools in the US and internationally means that they're the easiest tools we have as investors to diversify. So now that we have some ingredients, let's talk about the power of mixing. And to, to talk about the power of mixing, I think one of the best things we have is Paul's ultimate buy and hold portfolio buildup that he does. He talks this through every year and he talks through this chart on the left. And if you can't read it because it's too detailed, don't worry. We're just going to look at some moving dots on the right. That's what's really going to matter here. And the chart on the right is uh, what Frank earlier called an efficient frontier chart. So it's got the standard deviation, which is a measure of risk on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, it's the compound annual growth rate or the an annual compound return. And so where you wanna be on this chart, if you could be is in the top left-hand corner because that's the highest return for the lowest amount of risk. And uh, if you were in the bottom right hand corner, you'd have a high return and uh, or I'm sorry, a high amount of risk for a low amount of return. That would be a bad place to be. So so ideally you want to move up or up and left if you can. And the way we start this analysis is with an S&P 500 portfolio, which has had a historical return of around 10 percent, 10.4 percent with a standard deviation of 17.2%. Now, if standard deviation, which measures the variability of returns, doesn't feel intuitively right, don't worry. We're going to show you what some of this means in terms of drawdowns and other risks that you might be able to intuit and, and understand more intuitively later. But for now, um, we're gonna take this S&P 500 and we're going to take 10% out of it and put it in large cap value. And what happened was we moved up and just ever so slightly left, but essentially we get a higher return 10.6% at the same standard deviation of right around 17%. And the next step is to add small cap blend. And again, we move slightly up. Then we add in US small cap value bottom left-hand corner of that chart earlier had a high expected return. It moved us even farther up with almost no additional risk. We still have essentially the same risk at a standard deviation of 17.3%, but we're now at a return of 11.1%. 
Finally, in the US, we add REITs that moves us up and left a little bit. And then we do a big jump. We add international diversification. Now, as I'm going to show you in a minute, international diversification, geographic diversification is not a factor. It's not expected to increase or decrease our return. It's essentially a hedge. It's insurance against anything bad happening in the one country that we live in or where we invest in. So the fact that the return improved, I would call good luck. Um, the fact that the volatility increased, I would call the price of that insurance or that hedge. But we did go up to 17.9%, which is a very respectable jump in return. And we're still, uh, or I'm sorry, up to 11.7% compound rate of return and 17.9% volatility. So it is a little bit higher in volatility, and uh, but a, a, a jump in return. And then the last jump is to add in emerging markets, which we do expect to have a higher return because they're more volatile and and uh, less secure than the US and international developed markets. And that takes us up to a compound rate of return of 12.1% with a volatility of a uh, standard deviation of 18.5%. Now, what did that really mean for an investor who invested a lump sum of money in 1970 and wrote it all the way out till the end of last year. Well, what it would have meant is for the S&P 500, they would have had to have tolerated a drawdown of 51%, pretty bumpy ride, um, but they would have grown that nest egg from $100,000 to $18.9 million. In contrast, the ultimate buy and hold more than doubled that to $41.8 million, and the added bumps in the ride were 7%. So instead of a 51% worst case drawdown, they had to tolerate a 58% worst case drawdown. So if we zoom out on that same chart, I wanna do this just so you can see that we've been kind of looking at this tiny space on the chart. You can see that small cap value is way up and to the right. It's much more volatile than any of these broadly diversified portfolios we just talked about. And that bonds are way down to the left. So way safer and much lower return. And that begs the question, what would happen if we combined with bonds? That's our greatest opportunity of diversification because bonds are way different. They, they are much, much different from the equities that we've just been looking at. Could we move things around on the chart more? And the answer is absolutely. Absolutely. And this is the form of diversification that gives us the most control over the amount of risk that we're going to tolerate uh, or have to tolerate to get any given return. So you could invest, like I said earlier, 100% in the S&P 500 with that standard deviation of around 17%, or you could have invested in the ultimate buy and hold portfolio and only put 30% in bonds uh, or only put 70% in equities and 30% in bonds and over that period of time gotten the same return but a much much lower level of risk so you could move to the left on this chart because your equities are more diversified and they have a higher expected return you don't have to take as much risk in equities and you can temper that with bonds and we have these charts they're called fine tuning charts on the website and they, they will help you decide how much risk you should take uh, or how much risk you need to take to get a given return with any given portfolio. Now, like I said, this standard deviation thing seems kind of academ academic and it's hard to understand. So let's look at these same portfolios in terms of their uh, drawdown, their worst drawdown. So the 100% equity portfolio was over here at this 57% worst case drawdown on the right-hand side of the chart. The 70-30 we just talked about, which you remember had a return that's comparable to the S&P 500, only had a drawdown of about 43%. And in contrast, the worst drawdown for the S&P 500 was 51%. So you have this opportunity to understand how much risk you're taking what the worst drawdown since 1970 has been, what kind of return you would have gotten since then, and use that to set expectations for the future. 
let's visualize those drawdowns though. So this bond ride from 1970 would have been a smooth ride to a small amount of money. You know, it gets us up to three or $4 million. The hundred percent stock ride was a bumpy ride that got you to a very large amount of money up around $43 million. And the really cool thing is that you didn't have to pick the extremes. You have all of these choices in between. And I think if, if you get nothing else out of diversification, understand that your choice of equities and bonds, that form of diversification is going to let you control the expected return that you get, as well as how bumpy the ride is going to be to get you there. Now, I mentioned that we have these fine tuning charts for different kinds of portfolios. We have them for the S&P 500. We have them for the worldwide ultimate buy and hold that we just built out that has 10 funds. We also have them for the worldwide all small cap value. And what I find really interesting is when you chart them all on this um, risk versus return chart that we have on the right hand side, if you need 10% return, the safest portfolio or the one that gives you the smoothest ride historically is actually the worldwide all small cap value uh, combined with bonds. Because, uh, here, let me grab a uh, highlighter. Yeah, if, if you just look on this row right here at 10% return, the S&P 500 would get you that 10% return historically with an 80% equity position. The ultimate buy and hold would get you there with a 60% equity position. And the all small cap value would have gotten you there with a 40% equity position. So I'm not guaranteeing this will happen again in the future. And in fact, I'll show you reasons it might not happen again in 10 years or 15 or 20 years. But over the long term, which I think is the best way to judge these portfolios, the worldwide all small cap value combined with bonds gives you the highest return per unit of risk. And I think that's because it is the most diversified portfolio. It's firing on the, the, the widest range of different cylinders, if you will. It's got great exposure to small, great exposure to value, great exposure to the market great exposure to term, great exposure to credit risk. It's got a very balanced engine, if you will, and it's closer to what academics would call a risk parity portfolio. And, uh, and that's why it gives you this higher return per unit of risk. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to simplicity, because I know some of you are also probably thinking, oh my gosh, he just got into 10 fund portfolio. I can't do that. I need something simpler. And the good news is you don't have to use 10 funds to get these benefits. If you've followed Paul's work, you've probably heard him describe this ultimate buy and hold portfolio that includes all these 10% slices as having small, half in small, half in large, half in blend, half in value. And it turns out there are a lot of ways to get those benefits. We have two four fund portfolios, one U.S. two fund portfolio that have those same attributes. The U.S. four fund portfolio is 25% in the S&P 500, U.S. large cap value, U.S. small cap blend, and U.S. small cap value. The four fund international or worldwide is 25% in U.S. Lar uh, large cap blend, the S&P 500, 20% in U.S. small cap value, 25% in uh, international large cap value and 25% in international small cap blend. So both of those only four funds still have half in large, half in small, half in blend, half in value. Now, if the academics are correct, and it's how much you tilt towards these attributes that determines the return and the volatility that you experience, we would expect those portfolios to perform in roughly the same way. And they have. The annual returns for all of those portfolios have been about 12%, and the worst case drawdowns have all been about minus 40%. There are minor differences. You know, we get down to minus 37 with the two fund portfolio, but uh, I would say that in general, they've, they've all performed roughly the same. And what's more, you can do this with a two fund for life approach. 
if you have a young person that is 25 years or more away from retirement, they're in the early part of the glide path of, and, and I'll talk about that later too, the, the early part of the target date fund, and you combine that half and half with small cap value, it has historically had a 12%, 12.1% annual return and a minus 41% worst case drawdown. So, so you don't have to be complex. Now, another form of complexity some people bristle at is international geographies. And I said earlier, geographic diversification is not a factor, it's a hedge. And why do I say it's not a factor? Well, just look at this chart. This chart shows you how equities have waxed and waned between the United States international developed markets and emerging markets over time. And what you see is that there have been periods of time when the United States crushed it and dominated for a decade or more, multiple decades, and there have been periods of time when the United States was outperformed by developed markets. And I think it would be difficult looking at this picture to say there's any specific pattern. And that's what most academics say. Most academics would say that the expected return for the United States and for developed ex-US international markets should be about the same. Now you can get into valuations that you know may say that there are periods of time when one or the other looks more promising. If you did that, you'd say the, the US is highly valued right now. And that's part of the reason it's had this, this rise in share of the international markets. And that might predict that the international markets will outperform in the future. I prefer to just think of international diversification as a hedge and not try and second guess how much any of these is going to grow or decline at any point in time. And so what we do in our investing, and I would encourage most investors to do this, is to think about how much international diversification you can stomach, how much you can tolerate up to 50%, and then pick an allocation that will let you sleep at night, because that way all your eggs aren't in one basket and you're not exposed to this concentrated risk in the United States that you're not going to get compensated for. So that's that's international diversification. Basically, don't ignore it, um, but don't take on more than you can you can sleep with. So so far, we've talked about this stuff as if it's lump sum investments, but none of us are going to really be lump sum investors as accumulators. We dollar cost average into investments. And as retirees, we're going to dollar sale average in our withdrawals. So what I want to do is take a, just a, a few moments here and do some lifetime scenario analysis, looking at somebody who accumulates for 40 years at a 10% savings rate, and then is retired for 30 years with 4% fixed withdrawals, using fixed in the typical financial sense where you would take 4% out of the portfolio in year one, and then in each additional year, you would increase the withdrawal by inflation and take that amount for the remaining, uh, for each of the successive years through the 30 years of retirement. So let's look first at the S&P 500 as a baseline. And oh my gosh, I can't believe this. <laughs> if I invested 10%, that 10% gets multiplied by 70 times. If I'm a young investor and I look at this chart, I'm going to say there's there's no way I'm saving 10%. I could get by with saving 1%. Why do I save 10%? But the problem with this chart is that it's in nominal dollars and the money you're going to spend in retirement and the money you're going to have left to legacy is going to be big numbers that aren't worth much in today's dollars. So, okay, let's supply some realism. Let's look at the real returns by backing out inflation. Okay, all right, this is starting to look a little more reasonable. So somebody who invested that 10% across a lifetime would multiply that 10% by 18 times in today's dollars. Now this, keep in mind, is 100% equities all the time throughout their life. Most people won't do that, and we'll get more realistic in a minute. But assuming they did that, they would get a very respectable return of 18 times uh, real earnings. At least they did historically. That's the median result. 
their mileage might vary. They could have had bad luck and maybe it was only 10 or great luck and maybe it was 36. It's hard to know. Um, but we're going to look at the medians. But there were some problems with it. Uh, first of all, you've got this 50% uncertainty in the size of your portfolio as you're approaching retirement. And you may experience a 50% drawdown anywhere along the way. That could be right the day you retire, the day after you retire, 10 years into retirement, 20 years into retirement. So that that's probably uncomfortable for a lot of people. The other thing is that it only had a 30 year safe withdrawal rate of 3%. Now what that means is that there were a number of times in the scenario analysis where people ran out of money. So that's not good. We'd really, if we're using a 4% safe, uh, a 4% withdrawal rate, we'd like to see 4% in that box down there. And also the legacy spending is a lot more than the money that was spent in retirement. And most of us would probably rather be a little more balanced there. But let's stick with all equities for a minute and just look at what would happen if we use the four fund solution that we talked about before that has 25% each in US large cap blend, US small cap value, international uh, small cap blend and international large cap value. So this is the Merriman Worldwide four fund. Well, it more than doubled. So again, all equities, not realistic, but it took it from 18 times to a real multiplier of 40 times, and it boosted the safe withdrawal rate. Now, this is the first time we've seen this, but this is a really important thing for retirees. Retirees who take a more diversified portfolio approach, putting some of their investments into small, some of their investments into value, in addition to just being in the total market, add to the resilience to the sequence of returns risk they increase their safe withdrawal rate. At least historically, that's been the case through every period of time I've looked at, and I think it will continue to be the case. Now, there are drawbacks here still. It doesn't track the market. That's a new drawback. It's highly volatile through, throughout. In fact, the drawdowns here were 57%, and the legacy spending is even more than, uh, than it was before as a percentage of the total. So let's apply some realism by assuming that people follow some kind of declining equity allocation. And I had to come up with some assumption here. So I chose a target retirement fund. Uh, I chose the Vanguard one. And the reason I did is that if you look out at young investors in the world today, most of them will be defaulted into a target retirement fund. And many of them are, are already investing 100% in a target retirement fund. So it's a, an allocation that's going to be used within your children's lifetime, your grandchildren's lifetime, probably. And what it does is it starts out at 90% equities. And then at around age 40 or 25 years prior to retirement, it starts to ramp that down and it ramps it down to a 30% allocation to equities by seven years after retirement. And then it holds it at that 30% equity, 70% bond allocation into retirement. So we can use this as an, a, a dynamic allocation and go back and run that same analysis I just talked about. And what do we see? Well. First of all, it's automatic for life. The investor who uses this approach never has to touch their portfolio other than to invest and withdraw. Um, second, now we see the volatility declining with age. So as somebody is approaching retirement, they're gonna have greater confidence in the size of the nest egg that they have. And that's indicated over here on the right as the worst drawdown at age 65 is only 27%. So you have less than a 30% uncertainty in the size of your nest egg and therefore the size of what you could live on in retirement as you're approaching retirement, which seems like a good thing that would be a comfort to most people. It still has a very respectable safe withdrawal rate of 3.7%. It's not quite over four yet. Um, and the spend, the money you spend in retirement is greater than what's left to legacy, which is the first time we've seen that. And that's, that's probably a good thing for most people. But it does have this lower overall return of only an eight times multiplier. Now, in truth, the previous analyses were kind of unfair because somebody who invests in the S&P 500 probably would have added some bonds too. And the same thing is true for 
a tilted portfolio like the worldwide four fund that we looked at. But would this 8x be bad? Well, if we assume that somebody made $100,000 per year just to keep the numbers round, and they spent $90,000 a year while they were working, it turns out the median withdrawals in this scenario would have been $67,000 a year. And if there was a 10% employer match, that would get you up to $73,000 per year. And that's roughly 80% of the pre-retirement spend rate that's actually pretty good and if you add in social security i think for most people this would be a comfortable secure retirement and that kind of explains what the target date fund is for they're kind of they're trying to come up with prudent advice that will work for the masses for people who are never going to study investing never sit on a saturday morning listening to me blather on about diversification um just the masses and I think it's a fantastic, fantastic investment tool for the average uh, employee today. It's, it's really a wonderful thing. But from what we saw before, how diversified is it? It's not very diversified. All it has is exposure to stock market risk, term and credit risk, and worldwide diversification. It doesn't have any tilt to small or value, profitability or investment. So what would happen if we took just one penny out of the dime of every dollar that our investor is investing and put it in small cap value? So our investor's investing 10%, that's one dime out of the dollar. Let's just take one penny out of that dime, 10% of the 10% and put it into small cap value and we won't rebalance. And in retirement, we'll just take, we won't even rebalance in retirement. In retirement, we'll use what I call nudge withdrawals. We'll just take from whichever pile of money is bigger than it's supposed to be. So we've got a 90-10 allocation. If the target date fund is at 93%, we'll take the 4% that year, all from the target date fund. And what do we get when we do that analysis? Well, instead of an eight times multiplier, now we have an 11 times multiplier. That's actually a very nice jump. And instead of a 3.7% or 3.9%, I think, safe withdrawal rate, we're now over 4%. Those are really big benefits. That's a great thing. And we have this nice balance between the money that's spent in retirement and in legacy. We still have a decline in the amount of money uh, or drawdown risk that we're seeing so that by age 65, we've got a 35% drawdown risk. It's a little more than 30% instead of a little less, but still probably very manageable for most people. It does have this issue though, that it's different. We're not tracking the market. And I'll talk more about that later, but for any of these more broadly diversified portfolios, the investor has to stick with it. They would have to stick with this. So if a little helps, what about a little more? If we look at an 80-20 allocation with the same assumptions, we get 15 times multiplier and we start to see the legacy becoming bigger again than the money spent in retirement. But we've almost got the same return that we got with the S&P 500, but which with much lower risk declining as we get into retirement and with a much higher safe withdrawal rate in retirement of 4.6%. And if we dial it to 11, and we go for that half in large, half in small, half in blend, half in value portfolio by doing a 50-50 combination of the target date fund and small cap value. Now we're a 31 times multiplier, real multiplier of the money that we saved. And it's massively diversified. It's still got a very high safe withdrawal rate. But again, it has shifted more of the money into the legacy. So hopefully these scenarios with the cash flows just give you an idea of, of how this might have played out over a lifetime. Now, I know none of you are going to live any of those scenarios. In fact, nobody on the planet will ever live one of those scenarios. So I think it might be interesting to you to also know how these combinations have done in the past as lump sum investments. And we can approximate the target date fund by looking at a fairly simple allocation to US stocks, international stocks, and intermediate term bonds. 
And so what I've done is I've created these models for each of the allocation horizons of the target date fund. And you see those up here on the chart. Um, so for the very early target date fund, it's over here on the left. And for the very late target date fund, it's over here on the right. And then we can use those allocations and we can back test them. So we can look at if somebody were invested in, for example, a target date fund with the vintage 2035, what historically have been the returns and the risk associated with that asset allocation going back to 1970 and the 30 year safe withdrawal rate going back to 1928. And you can see that the, the nominal CAGR over that period of time was 9.2%. The worst 10 years was 3% CAGR. The annualized standard deviation was 10%. The worst drawdown was minus 36%. And the 30 year safe withdrawal rate was 4.3%. So that's just one example, but we can also show this for mixes with 10%, 20%, or all the way up to 50% allocation to small cap value. And you can look on this chart and you can see all these characteristics. So I know this seems like a lot of information on two funds for life. And some of you are probably like wondering, why did I include this in a presentation on diversification? And the reason is that this is the only chart I know of, the only single chart anywhere that I've ever seen that compares diversification across fixed income equities, size, and value with metrics for accumulators and retirees all on one page. It's the only place I know to get it. And it's something that you could implement with a target date fund or by using balanced funds or retirement income funds or other index funds. So I think it's just a really interesting collection of examples for you to take a peek at. And these are the asset allocations for all of the boxes. So how would I imagine you using this? Well, you could, for example, say that what you really care about is the compound rate of return and that you really want to have something that historically had more than 11% compound annual growth rate. And you could find all of the portfolios that had those characteristics or you could say, I'm a nervous Nelly and I want less than 40% peak to trough loss in my portfolio. And you could find all of the portfolios on this chart that had those characteristics. Or you could say you really care about safe withdrawal rates because you're in retirement. And what you really want is a portfolio that is resilient to sequence of returns risk. And you could find all of those portfolios. Or you could say you wanted all of that. And there's one portfolio in the bottom right hand corner that does that. And once you find the portfolio that has the characteristics that you think are the best fit for the return that you need and the risk that you can sleep with and the, the uh, safe withdrawal rate that you want to have in retirement or resilience to sequence of returns, uh, then you can take that portfolio, say it's this one in the bottom right hand corner, and you can see what the asset allocation was that was back tested to get it. In this case, it was 9% US total stock, 6% international stock, 35% inter intermediate term bonds, and 50% small cap value. It's interesting, that doesn't sound like a very diversified portfolio, does it? It's very concentrated in this asset class of small cap value. But because it has so much in bonds, which ex are exposed to term and credit risk that are very different from market risk and small and value risk, it actually is a very diversified portfolio. So it might sound easy to you at this point. I'm hoping at least some of it sounded easy and I'm sorry if it didn't. But that begs the question, why doesn't everybody tilt? Why doesn't everybody tilt to small in value? And I have two pictures that I think can help explain it. If you had listened to Paul in 2013 and switched out of the S&P 500 and bought into the ultimate buy and hold, you might feel a little like a chump by now. Because since 2013, the S&P 500 and large cap growth and large cap blend in general in the US have been on a tear. They've just, they've done great. 
and you would have underperformed the market. This is called tracking error, and it's really, really important. You can pick a strategy that has a very long-term higher expected return and underperform for what to humans seems like a very long time. Even if I go back to 1998, you can see that for the bulk of the time, you would feel like you had made a really wise choice, but we're coming up on a period of time here around 2024, 2025, who knows what will happen, where maybe once again, you feel like you've made a poor choice. So you have to be able to pick an investing strategy that you're comfortable with and you can stick with if you wanna be a good do-it-yourself buy and hold investor. And only you know what that is. And I, I like to think of these two birds when I think about the types of investors there are in the world. Um, I saw both of these birds when we were in New Zealand, or, or I'm sorry, in, uh, <laughs> when we were in Iceland. The, the one on the left is the Northern Fulmar, incredibly graceful bird that cruises across the sur surface of the water, just you know, millimeters across the surface of the water, and it snatches fish off the top. Then you have on the right, the Atlantic Puffin. The North Atlantic Puffin hardly looks like a bird. It looks like it can't fly, but it has superpowers. It can dive, it can dive deep. And it's got this bill that has hooks on it so that it can grab a fish. And even while that fish is wiggling in its mouth, it can grab another fish because the hooks keep the first fish in its mouth. So the, the bird on the left reminds me of an investor who's going to not study investing very much, not going to take the time to learn about these long-term returns, follow the S&P 500, feel bad every day that they're not tracking the S&P 500, and for them, the advice of Bogle and Buffett to invest in the S&P 500 and temper it with bonds as needed is perfect. But if you're an investor who's willing to develop some superpowers by diving deep, becoming a student of history, understanding particular uh, returns and differences of returns, then maybe you can invest with conviction in something else. And maybe you're a mix of both. Maybe what you really want to do is be 10% of the puffin and 90% of the northern fulmar whatever works for you. I, I'm okay with that. And I think a little diversification is better than none. So to summarize, uh, diversification can do a lot of really powerful things for us. It can increase return per unit of risk. It can minimize the risk that we take to get the return that we need. It can increase our safe withdrawal rates, or as we learned, the resilience to the sequence of returns risk. It can help us protect against concentrated geographic risk. It can reduce the uncertainty of results like we saw back there with the 10 S&P 500 stocks versus the S&P 500. But impatience can undo it all. Chasing performance can undo it all. So my hope is that this helps you zoom out and it helps you to, to motivate you to keep learning. Um, I'm certainly trying to do that, not just in investing, but in all facets of my life. And I think that's the, the best way forward for all of us. Now, if you want to learn more, um, we have a website, paulmerriman.com, that includes books, articles, fund recommendations, videos, podcasts, and two of the books, Two Funds for Life and Paul's latest book, We're Talking Millions, are available free by PDF if you sign up for our newsletter. And um, Paul Hayes, a good friend of Paul Merriman, recently updated his book, Spending Your Way to Wealth. If you're more interested in a behavioral side of personal finance, I think it's a, a really great book. Everything in this presentation, uh, this is just the standard disclaimer. This is for information and entertainment. If you need professional advice, go get it. <laughs> and with that, I'm ready to open it up for questions. And I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we. Um, I, I guess you've explained things pretty well, Chris. Uh, right now, we don't have any uh, questions, but I'm sure there are some. So I'd ask uh, the folks to go ahead and enter them in the Q and A bubbles down there. Um, and meanwhile, um, let me ask you a question that um, 
I, I understand that you're looking at the long run. Uh, a lot of the statistics are based on fairly long run performance of these port various portfolios under different conditions. And, you know, part of the point is to show you which ones perform best uh, in a variety of conditions that were experienced during that term. But um, if we look at someone, it, it, it's likely that most of our audience is in or near retirement, as they like to say. And uh, what I'm wondering is, uh, for those folks who have retired in the last five years or 10 years, what would have been their experience? Their exper it, it looked like from one of your last charts there that that their underperformance of the S&P, I, I guess what I'm really asking is when you have a set of uh, a sequence of you is about sequence of return risk ultimately that when you have a a sequence uh of years not just one year that you have to get through but multiple years where um for the most part your approach is not performing quite as well uh you know and you're withdrawing uh, right. That's a key element of it. And if you're not withdrawing, it doesn't make any difference. But if you're withdrawing, it makes a difference. So, you know, how how do you work through that, I guess? Uh, yeah, I actually have, uh, can you see this slide? I think I've- Yeah, mentioned. we can see it. Yeah, so this is a slide that speaks to this question. Um, when I, you know, we do try to scare people to some extent, uh, just let them know that there are these long periods of time when investing in small in value can underperform. And we do that because we don't want people performance chasing, switching in and out of investments. But uh, there's a website called IFA.com that has a series of charts and tools that I, I find very valuable uh, for some of these teaching questions. And one of the questions is how often over what period of, over different periods of time does small cap value outperform large cap blend? And even at one year, the odds of small cap value outperforming are about 55 and a half percent. At three years, it's 58 percent. At five years, it's 62 percent. I'm rounding here. 10 years, 74 percent. At 20 years, it's 99.5 percent. So what that says is as a retiree, if I were to invest a part of my portfolio in small cap value, that part of my portfolio is expected over time to outperform. It may underperform, it's kind of a coin toss within a year. But um, other than the fact that it is a little more volatile, so I'm gonna experience more ups and downs in it than I do the S&P 500, I'm not really doing anything imprudent um, because I have increased my expected return and I have increased my diversification. Now. I certainly wouldn't go all in on small cap value because now you've taken on a lot of volatility. You've gotten you've gotten rid of a different kind of diversification. Um, but uh, yeah, I think for retirees, it comes down to for most retirees, I think the best hedge against this kind of volatility and the way you're going to ensure that your portfolio lasts is to take on a fair amount of bonds or fixed income. And that's that's reflected up here in these charts where we looked at the um, the safe withdrawal rates. If you look at the safe withdrawal rates, uh, the one with the best safe withdrawal rates right here, uh, a lot of these high bond allocations over on the right hand side uh, are very high in safe withdrawal rates when mixed with uh, and and you can see a variety of them here through the middle, but. Um, Taking on bonds is going to reduce the port, the volatility of the portfolio, but it's also going to provide you from se uh, some sequence of returns risk. And 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 as a retiree myself, I I, I really value this um, this metric, the safe withdrawal metric, because it's the best proxy on this chart for am I going to run out of money? What's the probability I'm going to run out of money? If I have a safe withdrawal rate is, that is much higher than what I need to live on every year, I have a very low probability of running out of money. If I have a safe withdrawal rate, a historical safe withdrawal rate that's close to what I need to live on every year, 
then I have a higher probability of running out of money. And if if the safe withdrawal rate of my portfolio is significantly less than what I have to take out every year, then I have a nervously high level of risk that I will, will run out of money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that was good. Um, okay. We, uh, we have now, uh, folks have uh, entered questions. We have a number of questions. So okay. uh, let's start working on them. Um, Ricky asks, if using two fund for life strategy, what would your asset location strategy, especially with Vanguard TDF, especially with the Vanguard uh, TDF debacle a few years ago when the TDF was in uh, a taxable account? Yeah, that was that was a really unfortunate moment for Vanguard. Uh, and I, I think it was uh, uncharacteristic of them. They're usually really good about trying to be good stewards for their shareholders and investors, which are the same, you know, their owners and investors. What happened was they changed the the way the funds were structured in a way that uh, made it so a lot of investors realized a capital gain without having traded anything. And uh, that created a taxable event for people holding the target date fund in their taxable accounts. I don't anticipate that that would happen, happen again. They did it to get the expense ratio down lower. It's at about, it's 0.08%, I believe and to have that low expense ratio across all of their funds. So I think that was a, an uncharacteristic thing for them to have done and something uh, unusual to have happened to a target date fund. But I would encourage people where possible, obviously, to hold the target date fund in a tax deferred account because it is where the bonds are and it's where they're gonna have a lot of income, especially over time into the future. Um, it's one of the drawbacks of the two fund for life strategy. You don't have as much control over asset location. And that's one reason somebody might, for example, want to look at the allocations that I put up on that chart and implement it not with target date funds, but with other index funds. Because if you in implemented it with index funds, then you regain this control over your asset allocation. You could put all of the bonds in your tax deferred accounts and you could put the equities in the tax deferred accounts too, maybe, maybe not, maybe you have limits that restrict that. Maybe you have to get the small cap value in a, in a uh, different brokerage account. It, it, in any event, it gives you more control and that might be useful, yeah. Okay. Uh, someone is asking us, should the market rates of interest impact equity versus fixed income allocations? And he reminds us that for decades, rates were much lower uh, versus the uh, interest rates were much lower than they are today. Yeah, this is a market timing question. And I do everything I can to avoid any market timing in my own behavior or my own advice because I my fundamental belief about market timing is that the market can remain irrational longer than I can remain, li than I can remain liquid. Uh, that's a, um, a JP Morgan quote, I think. I'd, I'd have to go back and figure out who it was, but it, it, it's hard even when you know that you're at a moment where things are overvalued or that interest rates might trend in a different direction to know that they will do that tomorrow they can continue in the direction they're going in and not change or, or or change faster than you expect. It's like trying to predict when a branch is gonna break. You can hear it cracking, but you don't know when it's gonna break. And uh, so I really avoid as much as I can market timing. And I don't really think anybody else has shown that they're extremely skilled at it. Uh, and so th that, that that's kind of my starting point on that. We have gone through a period of time from 1970 until just recently, that was very, very good for bonds. And now we've gone through a period of time that was historically bad for bonds. Does that pretend that the future now is gonna be very good for bonds? I don't know. I don't know how fast interest rates will change. It's, it's, these market timing questions are so unpredictable 
uh, and so hard to act on with any conviction that we do everything we can to avoid them. Okay, that's great. I think it was Keynes who sometimes is credited with uh, uh, the business about the market being a Russian. Uh, um, thanks for that. The uh, okay. Another uh, an, another question is. Thank you, Chris. Any drawbacks with small cap value investing? How about using the total stock market only instead of the S and P and SCB? I uh, so the the drawbacks of investing in small cap value are essentially that you you need to invest like Rip Van Winkle, you need to invest with conviction and hold for a long period of time. And so it's important that you develop confidence in the history. And for a lot of people, they're going to look at it and say, you know, I have 10% confidence in the history, I'll put a 10% allocation in my portfolio, or 20% confidence, that's fine. Some is better than none. Um, the total market, as I pointed out earlier, doesn't have any tilt to small in value, nor does large cap blend the S&P 500. Both of them only give you market risk exposure. Uh, the difference between them historically in terms of performance and volatility is very small. So you can pick whichever one you like. I like the I like the S&P 500 because there's no tracking error. I like the total market because there's no, I'll call it a, a cocktail. Uh, I, I don't go to cocktail parties, but a cocktail party discussion, anxiety around not owning the latest hot thing. If you own the total market and somebody comes up and says, uh, hey, what about company XYZ? Have you heard about it? I'm going to make all my money on it. And you can go, I own that, right? You know, that's the great thing about the total market. And combining either one of them with small cap value is a, a great idea because small cap value gives you additional market risk exposure, but it also gives you exposure to the small and the value parts of the market, which are not going to move in lockstep with the, the total market. And so that's going to give you this chance to have a higher return per unit of risk, like we saw in the charts we looked at. Yeah. Okay. And so even though um, total market has all those small caps in it, they're their total uh, cap, so to speak, really does well, offset the yeah, large you, ones. The small ones offset the large ones and the blend or, and the growth ones offset the value ones. So although those stocks are in there, you don't get any of the premium or the diversification because uh, the the way those parts of the market are defined is really as, as uh, the small minus the large or the value minus the growth. And if you own them both, you you got zero, you got nothing. Yeah. Uh, the only way you get the tilt is to own a disproportionate amount from what exists in a cap weighted index. And the easiest way to do that is to add a fund that is concentrated in those parts of the market. Yep. Okay. Um, Sunil is asking <laughs> us, um, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, the slides uh, brilliantly compiled what the Merriman Foundation advocates. What strategies can we adopt to manage the behavioral aspects of tracking errors, especially when most of the financial press talks about two indices in the U.S. and are enamored with the latest tech stock? This is a tricky one. Uh, this is a really tricky one. I I don't think I could give you, I can't give you a well-researched answer. I'll just give you my answer. So, uh, I, every single time I'm tempted to trade, I force myself to stop and go do analysis and talk to my wife and to prove to myself that it's going to put me in a better position for the future. And nine times out of 10, somewhere in that process, I get derailed and I don't. So as a buy and hold investor, I think it's good to build habitual roadblocks to trading too much. I avoid all of the um, the financial media that is full of energy. I actually do this in news media. Well, if, if there's a lot of emotion in it, I avoid it uh, because I figure it's a self-serving behavior on the part of the media to try and get me riled up and excited. So I'll keep tuning in. 
the bad part in personal finance is that a lot of times that leads to bad investor behavior. So I think look away, look away as much as you can, not to the point of being ignorant, but if the if the media and the news that you're getting is overly titillating or overly exciting, it's probably not the part that's informing you. The part that's going to be more informative and educational is going to feel a little bit drier and less emotional. And so I try to steer my education in that direction. And then I also try not to look too often at my accounts because they're there for the long term, not the short term. Right, right. Okay. Uh, Sunil has a, a second question that's in a different area, so go ahead and ask it. Do you have any opinions on a strategy of liability matching portfolio with tips and having a rising equity portfolio as one ages? I guess there are two Ooh. questions there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so th uh, I think tips are, uh, a lot of people got enamored with tips in the last couple of years because we have been through this period of time with inflation and you can build a tips ladder in retirement that is you can be very confident it's going to provide you what you need if you have you know a specific level of income need and it's in it's uh, protected against inflation by the US government so I, I can understand why that is interesting it doesn't interest me that much because I know enough about a broadly diversified equity and bond portfolio to feel like I can get to the same place. Uh, equities historically have been a good hedge against inflation in the long term, not necessarily the short term, but in the long term. And so I don't feel I need to add that additional inflation insurance, if you will. Um, the rising equity allocation in retirement, I think, is very rational and a good way to explain it is if you follow Christine Benz's work on the bucket strategy in retirement, she says you should have a, a certain number of years of, uh, of, in, of spending available in short term to medium term bonds, then medium term bonds, and then you're, the, the money you're going to spend in later years in equities. Well, if you figure out how much money you're going to need to spend and you put a certain percentage into short term, your short term bucket in bonds, and then another bigger you know the, the rest in long term that's effectively an asset allocation so if you are a an oversaver that's going to be a very aggressive allocation if you're an undersaver it's going to be a very conservative allocation but what's going to happen hopefully over time is that the equities are going to outgrow the bonds and if you are just keeping those buckets the same size based on your living expense requirements and they're not expanding with the market, then you're going to see a smaller and smaller allocation to bonds as you age. Now, the footnote to all of this is that you're going to see if that happens an increasing volatility in your portfolio as you age. And what I've noticed among my friends is that a lot of people become more risk averse as they get older, even if they have oversaved. And so you want to make sure at all of the points along the way, that your the risk that you've taken in your portfolio doesn't exceed what I'll call your panic stop. So, for example, if you're somebody who's going to panic sell at a 50 percent drawdown, you should not be in a portfolio that historically has had a 60 percent drawdown. That would be a bad thing because there's a chance you're going to panic sell, uh, you know, a higher chance that you're going to panic sell when you shouldn't. Um, but as long as you stay within your own risk tolerance, uh, I think there's a lot of rationality to that increasing equity allocation because in many respects, especially if you're underspending that that growing portfolio, it's not for you. It's for charities and the next generation, and they might as well see it grow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, just out of curiosity, I know a lot of folks uh, uh, in the meeting today are probably AI members and are probably uh, seeing Christine Ben's presentations on bucket portfolios. Have y'all done any explicit studies or, or articles on combining your strategies with the bucket portfolio? Well, in, you know, her bucket strategy effectively results in a portfolio that is pretty close to an S and P 500 and bonds portfolio or total market and bonds portfolio. And we have, 
we have a, we have portfolios like that we, that we have back tested on the website and the actual allocation you end up with is using the bucket strategy going to depend on how you have saved so the fact that we cover a wide range of allocations uh, I think would let you find a point on those charts that would tell you something about how they have performed in the past. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, oh, um, the next one is uh, someone is asking uh, what small cap value funds or ETFs do you recommend? Uh, we have a set of best in class recommended funds that are listed on our website. I actually, I had those in my slide presentation, so I'll pull those back up. And you can go find them on the website and uh, let's see, they're up here in ingredients, I think, right? Nope, not there, right here. Can you see those? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So for the U.S. small cap value, uh, the fund we recommend is Avantis U.S. small cap value AVUV. But in addition to the best in class recommendations, we also have alternative recommendations over here for people whose 401ks might restrict them to a particular fund family that doesn't include our best in class recommendation. And these will be updated at the beginning of next year. Okay. Um, I guess in a somewhat similar vein, Jim's asking, are any other, uh, are there any other investment companies to consider for the target date funds? And, and uh, you know, for example, Fidelity, Schwab, BlackRock, that sort of thing. Yes. Uh, and in fact, uh, Paul recently mentioned BlackRock in his podcast because he looked at a 401k that had BlackRock instead of Vanguard, and he spoke well of it because it has a higher equity allocation in the earlier years and a higher equity allocation in retirement. The reason I don't put a lot of time into analyzing a best-in-class recommendation of target date funds is that most people are going to have a very limited selection in their retirement retirement savings tool. And rather than letting perfect be the enemy of good enough, I, I would rather have them focus on getting their savings rate up and taking advantage of that default and adding some diversification into small cap value rather than enviously looking over the fence at a slightly better target date fund that's available somewhere else that they can't get to. So. Um, but if you do, like if you're investing in a target date fund through a brokerage account and you have multiple ones available to you, then I would point you at Morningstar's annual target, uh, target date fund uh, analysis. They do a very good analysis of the families of funds and how they compare. And uh, if, if I was trying, in fact, I was trying to decide uh, on a target date fund for a two fund for life portfolio at Schwab. And so I went and looked at what Morningstar had to say about that target date fund because I didn't have Vanguard available to me commission free. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, another question is, uh, if I am 60 and adopt one of the buy and hold strategies, should I expect the result? Should I expect the results to be within a 20 year or a 40 year time frame? according to my life expectancy? Well, you should expect that the results are going to fluctuate <laughs> and you should expect that over time, the number, the compound rate of return number that you see will be closer and closer to what it historically has been. But that in your first year, it'll be very volatile and then it'll, you know, it'll, when you average over two years or three years or four years or five years, it's going to fluctuate over a narrower range. We showed the annual standard deviation of returns. Uh, the five-year standard deviation is narrower. The 10-year standard deviation is narrower. But, uh, you know, it's it's going to be uncertainty. uncertain. There's a lot of risk in any portfolio, whatever you choose. There is no guarantee. In fact, um, Larry Swedro recently did an article where he pointed out that there's no guarantee that equities will outperform bonds over a 20-year period of time. 
uh, you can go 20 and 40 years and, and make a simple choice like that, that I think equities are going to be better than bonds and have it not play out in your favor. So that's one of the reasons diversification is so important is that you don't know which of these is actually going to win. And so even though small cap value is the best performing asset historically over the history that I look at and the asset classes I look at, I don't put all of my investments in small cap value. I own a portion of my portfolio in small cap value and then a portion in these other asset classes in hopes that together they all deliver, deliver me a good return per unit of risk. And probably, again, the most important thing for a retiree considering that ultimate buy and hold portfolio is how much bonds, how much fixed income do you need with it to um, give you some meaningful diversification and risk reduction so that that, incre it, that that will narrow the range of results. It will increase your confidence that you're going to get a return. It may be a lower return, but it'll be a less uncertain return. Okay. And which actually, I, I think kind of, uh, because again, part of the, the issue in a retirement account is that you are withdrawing from it. You can't. Yes ignore it and let it grow the way you can in the accumulation phase. So, uh, which leads us to Bill's question. Uh, you described the nudge rebalancing approach. What rebalancing approach is most effective long-term, assuming that you're withdrawing along the way? You know, I have done various modeling and analyses over the years of different withdrawal approaches, rebalancing approaches, both of them. And I've never come up with anything that was what I would call numerically significant or profound, whether you rebalance and withdraw yearly, whether you don't rebalance and use nudge withdrawals. I did compare the nudge withdrawals to uh, the rebalance and withdrawal or re withdraw and rebalance, and it just didn't change things very much. So. So that's why I did the nudge withdrawals is that I knew that for some people it was going to be this math problem, right? If if you tell somebody you have to go into the account and figure out what percentage this fund is greater than it's supposed to be and then, you know, take your withdrawal in a way that it it just it, it turns it into something a lot of people I didn't think would do. And in our own retirement what we have found is that we do nudge withdrawals. There's almost always an asset that is bigger than it's supposed to be by more than the 4%. And so we just take our whole withdrawal from that. And I thought, well, if it's going to be that simple in practice, why make it more complicated in the advice and the recipe we give to people? Now, if you have 10 funds um, and no one of them has dramatically outperformed, then um, the difference of nudge withdrawals starts to matter because now you're talking about individual allocations that are 10% and you're talking about take, taking out 4%, you can you can basically overshoot by a greater amount. So I think as you get into a portfolio with more funds, it makes more sense to take from the whole portfolio or use your withdrawal to rebalance the portfolio. And I'm sure a lot of the people on this call will know how to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, well, someone's asking, what is the best way to invest in small cap values? Patiently. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that the ETFs are really, if you could invest in the best in class ETFs that we recommend, uh, they are very tax efficient. So I, I like the ETF because the wrapper makes the investment more tax efficient. You don't get these unexpected capital gains that you see out of mutual funds. If you can do it in a tax deferred account and reinvest the dividends, then you don't even have to pay taxes on the dividends that are coming in and you're more of a total return kind of investment and that's even better. So those would be the two top of mind things that come. If you're, if you're a young investor, dollar cost average in and celebrate it when the market's down because you're buying it extra cheap. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, the, uh, we're approaching, we're actually pretty much at 12. So uh, let's just see what remaining questions we have. Um, 
here's Ricky asking, why would the quality profitability factors have a premium? It seems uh, those companies are less risky. So why would you be compensated more to hold them? I, I'd encourage you to go read uh, Larry Swedro's book. The I think it's his ultimate guide to multi-factor investing. And he'll he'll give you bigger definitive answers on that. I think that uh, my quick answer would be that there, the market is mostly efficient to a point, and then human behavior kicks in on top of that. And we tend to overestimate the impact of bad news and underestimate the impact of good news. And I think it's the behavioral attributes that probably help explain that. But Larry's book is a really good source uh, for a deeper understanding of all of these factors and attributes. Okay. Um, I think you've touched on this, but I'll, I'll just ask it. Uh, what, what do you, what do you think about simplifying and using VT, uh, the Vanguard world fund allocation to uh, global composition? I, I think it's great. And in fact, the charts that I showed at the end, you could use VT in place of the U.S. and international fund allocations and just do that all with VT. Uh, it's a really cost effective fund. And, and then all you're doing across that chart is mixing three funds. You've got VT, a small cap value fund and an intermediate term bond fund. And with those three funds, you can move anywhere on that chart. And I, I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll ask this one. It's a little bit different. Uh, Paul's asking, hi, Chris, I acknowledge that everyone's comfort level would uh, is different, but if you're willing to share, Paul is curious about how much of a small cap value allocation you personally use. Uh, that's tricky to answer because we are, I, I'm going to answer it in the context of the portfolios that are not distorted by one investment that we have that is bigger than it should be because of tax reasons. So if you take that that one out of the mix, we tilt a small in value, uh, kind of in that 30 to 40% range. Um, that was our, our design point when we created our portfolios. Uh, we, we have some, uh, we, we have some equity holdings that uh, were there long before I started becoming a student of personal finance that for tax reasons, you know, even though we've tried to make them smaller have gotten bigger. So that that's, that's why I take that out of the mix and we're, we're dollar cost averaging out of those, but at least so far they've, they've remained a problem. But I, I know from past experience that they can quickly become a non-problem. <laughs> okay. I um, Maybe just two more questions here. Um, uh, one, I, I don't think you've exactly touched on. Uh, do the same Merriman asset allocation principles apply for Roth accounts as no taxes due on withdrawals and no RMDs? Yes. Yes, they would. Okay. 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 Uh, and then, uh, oh, Ben has a question. It is probably something that at least occurs to all of us as we look at all this and perhaps listen a little bit to the financial press. Do you have a fund portfolio you use for speculative plays? Could you use the talking heads, high energy picks as a contrary indicator? I do not. Uh, all of our All of our money is invested as prudently as we know how, and I have successfully resisted any temptation to buy Bitcoin uh, or individual stocks um, for the last uh, 10 or 20 years, probably. Yeah, ex except for my employer stock purchase plan, <laughs> right. um, which which always had so so much tilted in its favor that I would have been silly not to take advantage of it. So Right, right. Okay, well, that that's very admirable, Chris. I don't know how many of us just don't have a little bit uh, off somewhere that we think may really yeah. do pretty well. Yeah, yeah, it's just okay. not. I, I it's just not in my DNA, I guess. Okay. Um, uh, we do have a question about your website. I'll, I'll just point out that uh, everyone can go to our 
our website, the AAIHouston.org, and uh, find a copy of your your whole presentation, uh, including your website. But uh, Chris, if you'd like to tell us your website again. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, paulmerriman.com. And Paul is the founder of the Paul Merriman uh, Financial Education Foundation. And uh, Paul is the salt of the earth. He, he did this in retirement out of his own funds. There is no conflict of interest. It only exists to help people find a more profitable future by learning how to invest prudently and wisely. And I love that I get to work with Paul. He's a, a really wonderful guy. And um, hopefully you find stuff there that is useful and helpful. And uh, yeah, it's just paulmerriman.com. Okay. And um, Shri, Shri, yeah, Shri has posted that uh, in the chat. So you can go there and find oh, it. Oh, good. So thank you, Shri. Uh, and I think that pretty much covers all the questions. I uh, appreciate your working, your, uh, your going ahead and doing that. I think the fact that in these kind of meetings, one of the real values is that our audience gets to ask speakers like yourself uh, questions, whereas uh, if they heard you in a lar larger venue or with a larger webinar, they wouldn't be able to ask those questions. So I it's, appreciate it. It's your my favorite part of the meeting, too, because I learn a lot in the questions. I, I learned more about the audience. I, in an ideal scenario, we'd do this face to face. I, I would enjoy that much more, but I appreciate the questions and answer part. This is really fun. Great. Great. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone. Uh, remind them that we're not going to meet in June. We'll, we'll be back in July and we'll have the information about those meetings uh, posted on the website and the other places we post this stuff. So thank you again, Paul. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Walter. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.